I have been keeping bees since the early 2000s. Uh, I've, I'm primarily a swarm catcher. All of my bees come from swarms. I encourage swarms. I love swarms. So this is outside of my bee yard. Good afternoon, sometime probably early, early May, late April, when this happens all the time up here. I live in a place where bees can swarm and there's just no problem at all. And I really like to encourage them to do that. It's a wonderful act of nature. And I, uh, how many of you have been in the swamp? Oh, look at that. I would like to be used buzzing around and all that. Oh my god, isn't that an incredible, incredible space? So, this is a video of me moving a swarm. Um, sometimes swarm, how many of you have had experience catching swarms and moving them? Oh, good, good, good. So, great. I'm going to look at this thing. So, um, swarms are, these are the most peaceful when they're in the swarm. They have a mission, and the mission is to go create another hive, another colony, and sometimes when they take off and leave, you know, they're taking off and setting off somewhere before they move into their final home, sometimes they don't, they don't land on, you know, the tree branch that's hanging over you put the cardboard box and you give it a good sharp shake and, you know, there they are. Sometimes they land on things like this is in my backyard, and it was uh, one of those metal swings, and there was just no way to take them off except by hand. So I like to show this video because I like people to understand that the bees, there is no danger with this. I don't get stung. And you just go really slowly. And you can see they really just barely land. You can see how many of them are in the air. If they've been there for another 20 minutes, it'd be stuck still calm. And they'd be. Isn't that cool? You put your hands into a swarm like that. It always surprises me how hot it is in there. It's, it's like dipping your hands into warm wax. So I'm going to talk tonight about the I'm going to talk about the I'm going to talk about the creating more eyes. This is how we bees co create. It's also the way that they instigate natural queen reproduction because when the old swarm leaves, they left behind their swarm cells. They left behind the eggs that are going to hatch into the new queen and the old hive that's left behind. And these are the triggers. No, no questions, no response. There's no more room left to expand. And if you don't let them swarm, they're honey bound because what happens is they're bringing in so much honey, there's so much pollen being put in there that there's no place to lay any more brood egg. So what happens is you, the size of your colony will actually diminish if you uh, if they're stuck that way. Um, I named my, I call my book The Song of Increase, and that's exactly, that's exactly what I'm talking about, is the time just before swarming, because it's probably my favorite time. And you can hear, the song of increase is what the bees call the time. I do talk to bees. Actually, I talk to bees. They don't much listen to me. They talk to me and I can hear what they say. <laughs> um, and that's what they call it. That's where I got the name, the song of increase. It's the time when everything in the hive is at its fullest perfection. And the bees are just thrilled and happy and, and they're about to go and reproduce and multiply themselves. So the swarm calendar is really kind of interesting. And I didn't learn much about the swarm calendar for the first many years. Um, it usually happens early to mid-spring. They have to make sure that there's plenty of pollen ready because they've got to feed the babies. And generally, a swarm will happen on sunny midday when it's warm and windless. That's when you'll get your, your primary swarm going out. We have a farm, so we hay. And one of the things about haying is that the, cow, the, the day looks like you knock your hay down and then it's the Pacific Northwest, for God's sakes. You have to leave it on the ground for five days without it raining. <laughs> so every year it's, it's like a 50-50 crapshoot on when we can cut our hay down. 
And I realized after a few years, I said to my husband, you know, if I get three swarm calls before noontime, you get right up there on that tractor and start cutting. Because the bees know. They know they're not going to leave the day before a big rainstorm. And they can tell the weather a heck of a lot better than us. So we've really come to trust this time. And sometimes you'll get a, a secondary or even a tertiary swarm. This is called a cast. And they'll come out often later in the season during the flow. And that only happens when the bees feel like, you know, we've got so much here that we could probably get one more, one more colony get started. So preparing the swarm. Like I said, plenty of food, larvae, and pollen all ready to go. And just before they swarm, they'll actually slow down the queen's laying and, and feed her a little less. And they wanted to trim up a little bit in it. In, in, in anticipation of this flight that's going to go on. The scouts will actually go out and they'll start checking things out. I use bait hives and I'll see these scouts out there checking out the, you know, they'll be checking it out. And sometimes when I go to pick up a swarm, I've had a few times I've caught a swarm and I put them in a, a really nice home. I know this is a perfect home for bees. And I put them in there and I start doing something else and whoop, up and out they are. And and it's so funny because from the time of swarming, from the time they settled on the tree to the time I got in the box, hardly a few minutes went by. But then within 20 minutes to a half an hour, they've already departed. And what they've done is those scouts already found someplace. I was just this diversion. And I said, hey, I've got the perfect home for you. And they've gone, no, nah, not so much. And off they go. So. If they decide that they're going to go elsewhere, it doesn't always mean there's something wrong with the, the hive box that you put them into. Sometimes it's just they chose a place and they're already ready. Um, just before they swarm, too, you can hear in the hive, there, there's this like this hum. It's like this really different sound to it the day before they go. It's, oh, man, it's really. <laughs> One time I was, I was up on my roof deck. And I had this little war hive set up. And I just kept, every time I walked by it, I kept saying, oh, God, I know they're going to swarm. I've got to get another box on there. And I just didn't do it. I have, I have a bunch of hives. And I just didn't get to it, just didn't get to it. Finally, one day, I said to my husband the night before, tomorrow morning in the war hive, you have to pick the whole thing up, put the new box underneath. I said, you come help me. You lift the hive up. I'll put the new box underneath. And you know, maybe we we'll give a little bit more room and keep them around a little longer before they swarm. So 8 o'clock in the morning, he picks up the hive. I've got the little new box sitting there. He lifts it up, and the whole bottom square was covered with a whole blanket of bees, and they were all facing the entrance, just perfectly parallel. They were like little, they looked like executives with briefcases at the, at the, at the, the train station. They were lined up, ready to go, and they were waiting until 10 o'clock when the sun was going to come in the front entrance. And he picked it up, and I went, oh, man, we're too late. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to stop these guys from swarming, from swarming. So we put the box back down, and I just watched. And sure enough, about 10, 10, 15-ish, all of a sudden, boom, they all came out, and they all departed. It's really interesting. Um, now, I'm going to go into a deeper calendar on the next page, but once they've already laid some eggs in there for the next queens, on the eighth day, the foragers, and this is, I say, when I say eighth day, if you had weather where it was sunny all the time, you could actually count out these days. Here, it's a little bit different because your hive can be getting ready to swarm, and then you have five days of rain past the day that they're planning on it. So it's a little mushy on the numbers here. But on the eighth day, they're going to cap the, cell, the cells to the queen, and the forage is going to gorge themselves on honey, and they're going to get ready to depart. Everybody who is a mature bee, which means a foraging bee, bees who are 16 days old and older, um, those are the ones who depart with the swarm. Everybody who's a house bee, anyone who's just born or all the way up to day 15, 16, they're still going to stay a house bee. That's the crew that gets left behind to raise the new queen. And that they'll become the new foragers as they mature. So the bees who stay behind, they're preparing for the new queen. 
um, the queen cells have already been built. On the eighth day, that queen cell gets capped. That's when the swarm leaves. And now what you've got is all the young bees left behind taking care of all those little swarm cells in there. And this is what queen cells look like. Can you hear me okay on this? Okay. Uh, this is what they look like. And it's really, it's really interesting in here because these cells, if you see, see this one here, it's got an opening on the bottom. That queen came out. She hatched perfectly fine. Um, over here, you've got one that's got a hole taken out of the side here. That queen got mushed. <laughs> she, somebody didn't want her to become a new queen. So when the old queen, when the uh, that first queen here went out, hatched out, she came back and she killed that one that hadn't hatched out yet. So you can see the difference. A hatch out on the bottom, on the very bottom. If you see that open, she hatched normally. She'll come back though, and she'll munch a hole in the side of it and sting that one in there that hasn't hatched yet. Okay, let's go through the calendar. This is um, from Phil Chandler's site. He did a really fine job on this too. Uh, and I laid out some days on the side that kind of matched up to ours, and I hope I did my math correctly here. So on the first day, let's call this March 1st, drone eggs get laid. So some of you in here said that you actually have seen some drones, seen some drones already. Ooh, early, early. <laughs> um, on day 10, the drone brood gets capped. On day 24, the drones hatch out. And the queen cells get started once there's drone cells and drones available. They start their queen cells. So now we're at the end of the month here, day 28 through 35, the queen eggs get laid. The old queen starts getting prepped to leave on her swarm. And then day 36, so now we're at the beginning of April, the drones are mature, the queen cells have been capped, and then right down there around uh, April 5th through 10th would be when your, your swarm goes. So that's it. This calendar started on March 1st. Then halfway, beginning early part of April is when you see your swarm. And of course, these can go for any dates. You can have swarms where this whole process doesn't start till April 15th. So that means look at counting down how many weeks later. But what I want to show you this for is because sometimes I know in the early days when I was beekeeping, I would think that the bees just decided last week to swarm. <laughs> And actually, before they swarm, they put in a good almost six weeks of preparation to get ready to swarm. So thwarting swarming isn't something that you can just do by, oh, say, add another box, and everything will be cool. And this, we're going to carry this out a little bit further. So day 44, the Virgin Queen comes out. So everybody, the old swarm's all gone. The Virgin Queen comes out. Um, Cast, what I've got that note up about there is sometimes if that hive feels like they're really a strong hive, then when you have that new virgin queen come out and get mated and try to kill the other queens that are in there, sometimes the um, worker bees, I call them maidens, the maidens will, will come out and they'll go, no, no, don't take these. These won't, we're going to save these three queens over here because the, the hive consciousness, they feel like they're so strong and they're so productive that they can actually get a second swarm out of there. So they will actually keep the queen from, from tearing into these other queens. They'll protect the, the later ones. And that way they can get that next cast out a little bit later. So on day 50, she gets mated. That would be about April 19th. And Close to a week later, she starts laying her own eggs. And then 56 to 59, the last workers in the drones laid by the old queen are hatching out right now. So you've still got some of the old hatch in there. And then, day 77, your first new workers. So look, we're all the way up to May 16th. That's your very, very first workers, your very first maidens being hatched out from your new queen. The first new drones come out just a few days later. Day 98 is when the last bees from the old queen now have died off. So you actually don't have a transition completed till about 100 days. Isn't that amazing? And then the new queen's eggs are laid and the forages are hatching out. So this whole process that started on March 1st is actually really fully complete by about 4th of July.
That's how many, for how many of you is that much longer than you thought it was? It certainly was for me the first time I saw it. I thought it was just a quick process. So here's some reasons why people prevent swarming. And like I said, I am really a strong, I'm pro-swarming. I want to let bees live the lives that bees want to live. I want them to have as natural a progression as, as I possibly can give them. So the reason, these are the main reasons. If you have less bees, all the bees that I've just departed, if you have less bees, you have less honey, you have less profit. That's pretty obvious. Um, also, if you're letting your bees swarm, you can't control the genetics. So if you really are hot on one particular kind of bee, that you want to progress and have queens from that particular kind, then swarming might not be what you want to do. On the other hand, I have people sometimes who say, I would like to introduce more of the feral genetics into my, my hives that I keep, but I went and bought these, what do I do? And I say, let them swarm once, and then let them mate naturally, yeah. and then you've just got 50% of your native, of your um, local feral genetics or, or kicking down <coughs> into your, um, your hive set. Swarms do scare the public. It's like kind of an endless mission to go on to keep telling them, you know, look, I can put my hands in there. I don't have to wear equipment. And by the way, when I say that, I wore equipment for years. So do not feel any less than that because, um, because you wear equipment. If you're comfortable with equipment, then you should be wearing it. And I, I wore the full hazmat suit for at least my first three or four years. <laughs> I, I was not quick on taking off, and then I realized, you know, maybe I could take off just the like the long pants. <laughs> and eventually, I progressed up to the part where I can put my hands in hives and feel quite comfortable about it. But still, sometimes I go up to my hives, and I'll, I just hear this sound that feels sounds a little bit different than normal. And I will put my veil on. And one time, I opened my hive on the fifth of July. <laughs> and the 5th of July, when you live in Clark County, where fireworks are legal, let me tell you, about 80 bees came whomping out of there, and they were all over me, and I was going, man, I am so glad I paid attention to my intuition and put my bee veil on. Unfortunately, I didn't put it on my hands, and I had my hands in there when I went to, just to check on them, open it up, and whoa, they came at me hard and fierce, and I was thinking, what in the world, that hive has never been hot. They have never done anything. And my friend Susan, who was with me, she said, do you think it had anything to do with all those fireworks last night? And I was thinking, there's Joseph and I up in the field at dusk doing our animal chores. And we were going, wow, listen to how much the ground vibrates when those fireworks 400 feet away are going off. <laughs> so anyway, I just want to say that. If you're wearing equipment and you're comfortable with that, you just wear your equipment and feel just fine about it. There'll come a day sometime when you don't, you maybe you don't want to. And, and progress at your own pace. Uh, let's see. And another thing I hear from people when I ask them about why did you let your bees swarm is that a common belief is that the queen can't keep up her reproductive force. And I remember this when I first went to bee school, my first year. I went to bee school, and I remember we were um, opening up hives. It was at a migratory beekeeper place. We were opening up hives and we were paired up with, I was paired up with a guy, I don't even know what he looked like because we were both wearing our full suits, and they said, open up the hive, okay, find the queen, easy to find because she's marked, you know, she's got a big yellow dot on her back, so we find the queen, and I'm standing there holding the new queen, and, and I said, okay, one of you reach in and, you know, pinch the queen, squish her, so he reaches in, he squishes her and kills her, and I, I don't know what I thought. The fact that I had a new queen in the little box in my hand, somehow I had not put it together that if one queen was going to go in, then one queen had to come out. And I was so disturbed that I don't really know what happened for the next 10 minutes because I kept going, I didn't know we were going to kill queens. I didn't know we were going to kill queens. Why do we have to kill the queens? And I asked, I said, why, why do we have to kill the queen? That doesn't seem right. And they said, oh yeah, we kill them every year because they lose their reproductive force. They just can't keep up. In the wild, a queen can have her reproductive capacity to lay new eggs for five or six years. Um, so I've even heard as much as seven years. So I've always kind of had that thought in my head about, well, why is that? Why is that? But then 
when you're raising queens with artificial insemination and when you're um, doing like a whole different thing than you do in the wild and you're also preventing swarming that makes more sense to me and when I went and asked the bees about it they said um, they said that what happens is when the swarm comes out the purpose of the swarm first of all all that chaos that you see the purpose of all that chaos is to hide the queen that way, if a bird comes flying through, she's not going to see her. If they're all coming out in a straight row, then you know you see little bee, little bee, little bee, great big bee, and that would be the one that the bird would go peck off. So they have this, you know, whoa. And bees have this unity consciousness. They have this awareness of each other. They they say they all think the same thought at the same time. They have a cohesion in their thinking, and they speak of themselves as a unity. And I realized how many times I've been out there in the middle of the field, standing in a swarm with 30,000 bees flying around me, and not one bee has ever bumped into me. I've never had, I've never seen a bee, and I stand in the middle of swarms all the time. I've never seen two bees collide. They see each other that way. Anyway, what they say is going on is that when the queen comes out like that, she comes out and she flies in the air, and it's the only time of the year when she's back out of the out of the hive. She comes out into the sun, and their explanation was that her day her day in that flying in the sun like that re-stimulates her hormones. When it re-stimulates her hormones, it it brings her her fertility back into her again. So if you prevent swarming, and you don't let the queen out, and then you have this queen who can't perform in year two, I suspect they're probably right. But that probably does have something to do with it. So it might be a swarm. And my queens are very fertile. Thank you. Ah, yes. We have a drone congregate congregation area um, on our farm. And sometimes I know where the area is, and sometimes I come out and I see these little exploded drones <laughs> on the ground. It's like, oh, you lucky to see you. <laughs> and at first when I found him, I didn't know about that. You know, at first time I was like, wow, what happened to you? <laughs> but those are the lucky ones. So queen is the most important. This is just a quick little review on this. The swarm conceals the queen. Every bee in that unity consciousness is aware of each other. And this was beautiful. They said that the swarm, that action of swarming is something that actually creates a bonding in the hive itself. I love that. They come out and it's like they're all together unifying themselves. The queen never sees the light of day except during the swarm flight annually. And the light renews the queen's fertility. So that's my reasons for why I let these swarm with that. So, um, yep, just walking around in another swarm. So, has anyone got a question up till now? Yes? If you have a strong hive that swarmed a bunch of times last year, I, I came into the, I had four hives in the winter, I dropped down to three, kind of down to one, um, which is sad. Never had that kind of loss, but it's that same strong one that gave off it probably four totals, one swarm. Yeah, which is a, a bit much. Yeah. Um, what I would do if I were you is I would put them in a bigger hive to start with, especially if you know that they they have a tendency to do that. We used to have a hive that we called the Uber Hive, and it would throw off swarms like crazy, always strong, and they always came out of it strong too. She, the queens through that line were just highly productive. Oh God, if I still had them, I would give you some of them because oh, they were good. They survived anything. Um, so yeah, they, I would say just uh, one that puts out a primary swarm and then three more casts, they just need to be really big. And that Uber Hive was the biggest, the biggest colony we ever had. Swarms looking like that. And this is just a quick little review on how to catch a swarm. Shake them into the box, put the branch or whatever, put them in there. Make sure the queen is inside. And we used to carry our box, our full, like a top bar around. 
Sometimes I do them in cardboard box, sometimes five gallon bucket because that's all I had on hand when I saw the swarm. My ears are so tuned to swarms that honest to God, I was driving down the, the road in my small town with my windows <laughs> down and I went, what? <laughs> and there was a swarm. And I was going, man, that, that's like whether I saw the shadow in my eyes or I heard the sound, there was something like it. And sure enough, there was a swarm out there in the field. So I try and make sure I have my swarm equipment, my swarm kit in the car at all times, because you never know when you're going to get called. Um, this is the finger brain phone. While you're watching this in the background, I can answer some more questions. Anybody? Yes? Yes. So is your bee swarm, do you actually catch your bees again? Yeah, I do. She asked if my, when my bees swarm, do I catch my mine again? Well, this, that's kind of a half a yes, because sometimes they just want to go. And if, my, if a swarm comes out and it goes 60 feet up in the hemlock tree, then I go, wow, have a nice life. <laughs> because those are bees I'm not going to catch. Although I did catch one by drumming them into a hive, calling them by drumming on the hive, and they actually flew back down into the hive. So there are some alternatives that we can do. Somebody else asked me another swarm question my favorite topics. Speak loud. Can you hunt for them or do you have to just wait to be called yeah. when you get to find them? There's a certain sound they have and I, I can hear them. Um, there's a, a swarm around here somewhere. don't know where it is. And how many, I, I bet you there's more of you in the room who have heard that sound and you recognize it before you, yeah, okay. It's just a certain swarm sound and you can hear it and you go looking for them. There's also times when the day is so perfect. I know there's a good weather report coming out that says lots of sunny days coming up. It feels about right. And I go out and I do look. I go out and I look and I you know, look at all my fruit trees and everything. There you are. Yes. If you let your bees swarm and you have a bait box and you hope that they don't bother neighbors, yes. where is the best place? I think actually this is usually what you see about this was inside of a uh, bait box. Um, we use for a bait box we use just about anything. Um, a box about that big by that big. Um, you can use a nuke box. They actually kind of like them a little bit smaller. So I can put an empty hive out there and you know, they do, they are attracted to places where bees have been before. So if it smells like it's got propolis in it and a little bit of bee comb broken up on the bottom, um, that is, that is an attractant. But frankly, I found that my bait boxes work better. And bait boxing is really fun. And there's nothing more fun than walking up in the field, going and checking your bait box and going, oh, look, they moved in. And all I've got to do is take that box down off the nail and bring it over. I usually, um, to answer your question though, I like to put them about 15 feet up. So we actually climb up on ladders and put them on hooks up in the trees. Um, Thomas Seeley did some work on what kind of things attract them. And that was one of the things he noted as well. And I've noticed what ones get filled in. Ones that I have down here, not so much. Ones that I have up there, you know, if you could put it at the top of that arch right there, it would attract more bees. And you know, when you think of where do they, where do they go normally? Inside a hollow tree. And a hollow, you know, a hollow up there is really a good place. Bees love to come out and like have a good quick look around first. So that's an advantage to have them up to a good height. And I usually put a little drop of lemongrass oil in it. And that lemongrass oil um, smells kind of like the queen scent. But when I put it, I put a drop of it on a cotton ball, just a drop, one drop, not two, not 10. And then I put it inside of a, a plastic baggie, and then I seal the whole thing and leave just the, like the last inch open so that you barely, barely think you're going to get any, any smell at all out of it. But the scouts will find it anyhow. I could stay here all night and listen to Jacqueline. <laughs> I hate to be the bad guy last week. Last month I got in trouble for going over, so maybe two more questions. OK. okay. Who else got a question? Oh, this is just pouring a swarm into another box. Yeah? My question is about if you say when you get your you get the swarm in the box yeah. and you want to do the transfer, sometimes it's after dark. Do you oh transfer? yes. Oh god, I'm so glad you mentioned that. 
don't do, don't transport them after dark. I think half the stings I've ever gotten in my life have happened when I disobeyed that. So when you bring them in, and you know, what I like to do is if I catch a swarm, I actually, you know, go catch it at say two in the afternoon. I like to leave the box there because the scouts are gonna come back. And I like to get them in, and if I can get them in, you know, say, just about when the sun is getting ready to hit the horizon, that's when I like to pick up. I feel like a bat out of hell to get home and get them in, loaded in. There's a critical point. There's a point where they're just friendly bees and you're moving them in. And then there's like one minute and they go, it's more dark than light now. And geez, they turn on a dime. And they get really quite nasty about it because a bee who's left out in the dark, they can't find their way home. They don't know where it is. So if they fall six feet away, that's a dead bee. So they get really antsy about it. One more question. <coughs> so I would just put them in the basement where it's cool. Um, I would just put a screen across the entrance hole and let them stay there overnight and then I would do it the next day. One more question. And yes, I'm all foundationless, yes, you can see. <laughs> And what's nice here is this was, um, this was coming out of the basket, but if it had come off a bait box, that picture a few back with the comb already built, they built so dang fast that I usually leave them in the bait box for a few days. I just let them stay right where they are. They get started, they build some comb, and then all I do is I take the bars out of the bait box and put them right directly into my new hive that they're going to live on. And they've already established some comb, so they're not going to go anywhere. So it's a, it's a more sure thing with the bait boxes. If you do want to learn more about this, I'm teaching, I teach two more swarm classes in the springtime. Uh, March 28th is a Saturday. That's the first one. It's an all day class on catching swarms, working with bait boxes, and doing cutouts as well. And, I do, and it's up on my farm. And I think the second one I do is the first weekend in May. There's a piece of paper on the back with my calendar on it that you're welcome to take home with you. And also, I brought some books. So I brought a box of If anybody would like to buy them, I would be happy to sign them. And uh, thank you so much.